Hi guys, um, welcome to our second online lecture. It's the eighth lecture of the season. It's on the body-mind relationship, and we're taking up today The Mysterious Flame by Colin McGinn, the first chapter. Now this is a pretty straightforward text, um, and I hope you all sort of uh, found that to be the case. McGinn is a very lucid writer, and he's writing, he's writing for a general audience. So he's dropped a lot of jargon. Um, so I will basically just be going through um, his text. I'll make a few insertions here. I've written down a few notes um, along with McGinn's quotes. Um, this should be this this lecture should be as straightforward as the text. I hope it to be. Um, and and in saying that too, um, I'll keep it simple, and then we can take it up in our. Um, in our Wednesday evening conversation, any problems that you have that I haven't um, allayed or foreseen in this presentation. So opening remarks. McGinn remarks early on, we are interested here in being conscious, not in characterizing oneself as conscious, in the fact of consciousness, not in its self-ascription. And the point here is that we're talking about the actual um, phenomenal experience of being conscious, right? So the experience of red, the experience of pain, as opposed to some sort of third party or third person description of this, um, of this sensation. Um, some sort of explanation of, of a neural process or some psychological description. We're not talking about those. We're talking about the actual experience that one has um, in consciousness, which isn't foreign to what we've been talking about because our whole, much of our class, especially on subjectivity, is talking about this, trying to get as deep into the actual phenomenal experience, that, that present moment of consciousness that we experience things. Um, that is the datum that we're drawing from. So, um, in other words, our interest is in the sensation of pain itself, as an example not in the ability to think about the fact that you are in pain when you are. Um, or, or, or again, in that C-fiber firing in the brain, right? Some sort of description of it that isn't the actual experience itself. So from again, consciousness is a datum. We can dispute the causes of what we consciously experience, but we cannot doubt that we consciously experience them. I hear a horn, for instance. I I can doubt the existence of horns, of cars that produce horns. Maybe I didn't even hear a horn. Maybe it was something else. But but I can't dispute in the end my experience of having heard something. That was there. That happened. That's datum. So McGinn states that the brain is like the womb of consciousness. That consciousness is knitted to the brain and rooted in its tissues. But this raises the question of the nature of the deep and intimate link. Can the mind be fully explained by the brain? Or are they really separate entities? What kind of thing is a brain that it makes consciousness possible? What is the nature of the bond that connects our conscious experience with the workings of the gray matter in our heads? McGinn's answer, that this is a mystery, an ultimate mystery, one that will never fully unravel. And McGinn is part of a, a very small philosophical circle who I think call themselves the Mysterians, um, sort of investing in this idea of a Mysterian theory that the mind-matter relationship can't be fully um, intellectualized or understood um, by, by the human intellect. Now we'll talk about whether this is satisfying or not at the end, um, but, but, but importantly he says this isn't a defeatism. I am not just th throwing my hands up in despair. I am interested in uncovering the deep reasons for our bafflement and examining the consequences of our constitutional ignorance. So in much, in much, in much the same way, um, he's talking about a sort of learned ignorance that Socrates, that was attributed to, to, to Socrates' philosophic style. Um, we are not, like a positivist, seeking some scientific finality of fact when we are philosophizing, not in the Socratic approach. Rather, we are seeking our utter ignorance to really fully grasp anything at all. What is the mind? What is consciousness? What is the person? What ultimately is being and existence? 
These are all questions that ultimately elude us. And it was Thomas Aquinas who said um, something to the effect that, you know, ultimately we can't even know the essence of a fly or a mosquito. We can't understand, we can't know the being of of things at all. Everything ultimately eludes us. There's no, there's no, there's no ultimate uh, bedrock we can reduce everything down to, into which we can, you know, plant a flagpole, and think we've conquered it. Um, and this was very much the Socratic approach. Um, but in learning what we can't know, we gain, in a sense, a richer understanding of these mysterious things. And our endeavor into personhood has revealed just as much. You know, uh, how much uh, how much is gained in our understanding of personhood? How much more do we apprehend of the human person, for example, when we realize that we can't, or, or how problematic it is to um, put the person in any sort of closed definition, right? There is something we encounter in the person that is so much more infinitely rich, I would say almost literally, um, um, and that that is uh, that is sort of drawn out in this understanding that we can't, you know, p capture the human in words. Um, we can apprehend what a human person is in that encounter, in the way that we apprehend a whole. You know, there's there's a comprehensive, cohesive whole right there in front of me called a person. Um, but uh, you know, but 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 this eludes any sort of. Um, discursive, rational grasp of the, of the person in the terms of, you know, in terms of uh, dividing um, the person into taxonomies of parts in order under, to understand them. This part of our mind that is always seduced to um, understand and reduce everything entirely is, is eluded um, by certain realities. If, if, we, um, if we make a study of that fact, Right. If we um, understand the ultimate, ultimately elusive nature of things, um, so the argument and structure of this reading, in this reading, McGinn will articulate the problem of understanding the link between the mind and the brain further, and indicate why the standard traditional responses to it do not work. So in the first part, we'll we'll talk about conscious meat, and the second, we'll talk about materialism, and in the third dualism. So, um, so part of this module this week was to watch a six minute video on YouTube, which if you haven't done, just pause this video simply and go and watch that video and come back. Um, <coughs> are you back now? Well, so this is a video that pretty much talks about, um, or, or is about aliens that arrive on earth and are completely befuddled and baffled by this um, this anomaly, it seems, where that, that, that meat can talk, that meat can think, that meat can love, that meat can dream. And um, it pretty much centers around that. The, the big the big question, of course, that comes out of this, the big question um, that it provokes in us, um, and like good fiction, um, it provokes, uh, it, it sort of shows us how extraordinary, ordinary things can be. But this thing that we take advantage, uh, take for granted, that flapping meat lips can talk, and that gray matter gooey things like brains can think, love, dream, etc. Um, it, it, it provokes us to ask the question, you know, why this disuniformity of the brain to other, other objects in nature? How does meat, the brain, think? Why do other organs not think? What is, what is it about the brain in particular? McGinn says that we can state the problem this way. Isn't there some kind of violation of the uniformity of nature and the fact that brains produce consciousness? If we were to observe all the body parts apart from brains, we would arrive at the conclusion that body parts do not produce consciousness. But then we encounter brains and are brought up short. They violate the natural belief that collections of cells do not generate minds. Is 
so brains, unlike kidneys and livers, have a quality to them that can't be quantitatively excised, described, um, observed. In, for all intents and purposes, it looks exactly like a kidney or a liver in merely its material um, appearance. McGinn compares this to observing that balls row down hills, then discovering one that takes off into the air of its own accord. So we will observe a bunch of balls rolling down hills as balls do, and then all of a sudden one magically flies off above us. However, where we would usually discover some explanation for a flying ball that was uniform with the properties of nature, i.e. going out and finding out that there's an electric motor, as McGinn mentioned, um, the brain appears to go against any such uniformity. There is no uh, there's no box to open. There's no um, hidden mechanism um, that makes this thing work the way it does. To maintain our belief in the uniformity of nature, and to not let this destroy our understanding of this cohesive, unified beingness we call the world, we are forced to deny that the brain causes the mind, or to try to find new properties of the brain to distinguish it from all other physical objects. We cannot just note the violation and shrug our shoulders. So importantly, we're not. This isn't a question we can be indifferent to, or or one that we shouldn't be. It's a real question, and it's a paradox that we ought to pursue. <clears throat> McGinn lists now. He again, he's re writing for the general reader, so these are sort of implied, um, and you might not have noticed them. But he talks about three de debunked hypotheses that are out there in the world. And one of them is complexity. Some say the brain is merely of greater complexity than, say, a kidney, and this endows it with consciousness. But sheer complexity is irrelevant. Merely adding more neurons with more synaptic connections doesn't explain our problem one bit. The problem is how any collection of cells, no matter how large and intricately related, could generate consciousness. In other words, does our kidney gain consciousness if it had as many cells as the brain? Would a galaxy achieve consciousness given more interacting parts? Does consciousness just emerge from a mere density of parts? Or are we just sort of deferring the question? Again, where does the, immater the immaterial emerge from the material? More, more connections, more interacting parts, more cells, more neurons, more densely confined... Um, don't in themselves squeeze out <laughs> immaterial consciousness, we might say. So, so, so this is a, a, a fallacious um, approach to understanding the mind-body relationship. The second debunk debunked hypothesis is this: is the simple idea of hiddenness. So, another red herring, uh, McGinn states, is the hiddenness of the brain, the fact that it is inside an opaque skull. skull and has an invisible interior, unless you cut it open. There is no logical necessity about this. Whether your brain sits inside or outside your head, the mystery of consciousness will remain. This theory more or less implies that the quality of being inside a skull, and therefore having hidden recesses, somehow corresponds to having a private consciousness. And I think McGinn talks about uh, opening your head and stretching out your brain so that it covers your body like your skin <laughs> this 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 it would still function as a brain supposing it, it it naturally could um and it has nothing to do with some sort of private consciousness hidden somewhere so the third um debunked hypothesis is is emergent consciousness is what some call it um, and and, and uh, again, for, for this particular one, um, McGinn doesn't use that word, but that's the understanding, is emerging consciousness. And this hypothesis states that consciousness, consciousness emerged out of a bioevolutionary model, much in the same way as the giraffe's neck. But this does not explain consciousness. The problem is in the raw materials, i.e. genes and cells. It looks as if with consciousness, a new kind of reality has been injected into the universe instead of just a recombination of the old realities. 
Again, the question, how can mere matter originate consciousness? Or how did evolution convert the water of biological tissue in the wine of, into the wine of consciousness? Now, to be clear, uh, too, I, uh, as I think it's usually necessary, McGinn is, isn't actually, he, he's not religious of any kind. He's not a religious philosopher of any kind. He is a merely secular philosopher um, who is studying this mystery, as he calls it, the mysterion of the brain. Um, so he's not anti-evolution here, and he doesn't use water into wine because uh, because he's a Christian. The the idea um, that he states here is very much like the idea that... Um, so the emergent consciousness would supposes that some things come together and create something entirely new of a, of, of a different kind entirely. Um, now, we could use the example here of... Um, H2O, for example, uh, two hydrogens and an oxygen um, come together and they make something new, water. So there is a newness that can transpire when two things come together. However, water is reducible back into H2O, right? It doesn't become some uh, something different of a different kind. It's still the same in degree in that it is merely um, um, that it is still reducible to the uh, to H2O. Sorry, I should say that the, uh, what's reducible is the hydrogen and the oxygen components. Uh, I've been saying the water. But H2O comes together to make water. Now that doesn't mean that water isn't reducible back into its hydrogen oxygen parts. So it's not something entirely new. It's still a um, a combination, you would say, of these two parts. Um, anyway, so consciousness, on the same line of thought, is different in kind. Okay, so whatever the brain is, the consciousness is, is it would seem to be different in kind, right? Whatever parts come in to make the brain, consciousness doesn't naturally emerge out of them. Again. The, the immaterial doesn't naturally emerge out of the material in that way. Um, and it's not ultimately reducible back into it. Um, if I've been a little bit uh, stilted and sh choppy in that explanation, feel free to bring it up um, during our Wednesday night. All right. Okay. And now we have the big bang to the saw. So black holes versus consciousness. Now here's a little bit of a just fun departures here. Black holes, matter at its most occult and extraordinary, are singular and striking, but perhaps nothing as compared to consciousness. Their gravitational force is minimal, but their effects on surrounding objects are even more astounding. Brains cause technology, society, art, science, soap operas, sin. Um, yeah, there you go. As extraordinary as black holes are, we often take for granted how extraordinary we are and what our impacts are in the are on the environment um, now that can be negative of course and when it's negative it's not that extraordinary but when we look at our positive um, contributions the one he's just he's just listed there they're 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 utterly miraculous you know whence Shakespeare you know <laughs> he didn't can we get that can we can we infer Shakespeare from the Big Bang can we infer love from the Big Bang? Can we infer um, personal encounter and all the things we've been talking about in this course from the Big Bang? Can we infer subjectivity, right? Will, um, intellect, etc., etc. But the brain's influence doesn't stop there. The brain also produces its, inside itself a whole new dimension of reality, conscious experience. Each living brain contains its own center of thought and feeling its own experienced world. It's a whole different dimension of reality. And we'll get into this a little later with um, um, when we talk about, you know, the difference between a neural process and the experience that happens on the other end of that, as it were. Um, the color red and the synaptic movement of neurons um, 
uh, that transpires when we have that experience. These are two different dimension, dimensions of reality, as it were. Um, different in kind, not in degree. The orthodox explanations. Um, so I've taken maybe a wrong graphic here. I'm not going to go into monism, but, but materialism, materialism more or less is. Um, but we're talking about materialism and dualism. Um, in, to in order to grasp the problem of consciousness, consciousness and its relation to matter, McGinn takes us through the typical orthodox, expl orthodox explanations. Again, materialism and dualism. So materialism is the first um, of the two. Materialism says there is nothing more to the mind than the brain as currently conceived. The mind is made of meat. It is meat, neither more nor less. A conscious state such as seeing red is just a bunch of neurons, brain cells doing their physical thing. So this view reduces consciousness, consciousness to no more than neural processes. In other words, there is no difference, say, between the conscious experience of pain and the process of C fiber firing through our brain. It is identically the same thing, just computed in two different ways, you could say. But this exp explanation assumes that both these data relate the same information. Now, could this be true? Could the experience, appearance of pain in our consciousness be reduced to its corresponding neurological process? And many, and there's many philosophers actually out there, um, Patricia and her husband, uh, their last name is Churchland, who, who believe in this radical materialism ex that explains consciousness, where we're we are essentially our, our neurological processes and this experience or the, this so-called experience we have of conscious reality of phenomenal consciousness is actually, um, is actually a sort of uh, a byproduct or a side effect of that, ex uh, uh, of that neurological process. And then what you get are zombies. And we'll be seeing more zombies later in the slideshow. So if this is true, if, um, if our consciousness is reducible to the mere material neurological processes, um, and that they emerge merely from them, if it is true, we must suppose that we are not really conscious at all. Our consciousness is merely the inside expression of a primary neurological response to our environment. In other words, we are all zombies deluded into believing we're conscious. But this would be like saying that there is no qualitative difference between the words water and H2O, that they're merely synonymous synonym, synonyms expressing the same thing. Now, don't confuse this water H2O example with the one I previously did. Here we're suggesting that H2O and water merely describe the same thing, that they're total synonyms, when we know in our experience that when someone says H2O, it doesn't necessarily invoke the same exact thing as water. And what, 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 what McGinn is saying here is that to reduce... Um, uh, our neurological experience, our neurological process to our experience of something in reality is like saying H2O is the same as water. We know there's a qualitative difference here. In other words, the materialistic conception of mind suggests that to know your brain in all its physical complexity, the position of every atom and its various segments, etc., is to know what's on your mind, your conscious states, your moods. To demonstrate the difference between this data, conscious experience, and neural processes, McGinn uses Frank Jackson's example of the experienced appearance of the color red. So just to go back there to that second point, you know, we know, in fact, and I think this has come up in our lectures before, but, you know, to, to, to know everything in your brain, to know what's firing around, to know what regions and hemispheres of your brain are sort of lighting up is not to know what you're thinking, right? There is really no machine, no person who can look at an active brain 
and surmise or infer what is being thought. You know, precisely. The tree you're imagining in your head right now when I say the word tree, I cannot know what that tree in your mind is. You know, we have, I cannot see that, um, that image. Um, nor can anyone but you. So, the example, so this is, here we're going to talk about the example of Mary. Um, Mary, who, uh, so Mary, who has been trapped up in a, let's say, in a black and white room um, all her life. Uh, this is an, a hypothesis by this Frank fella. Um, has been locked up in a black and white room all her life, sees only black and white, and has the has had the ability to just study the brain and, and all its component parts. Um, she knows everything about the brain, how it works, how it functions, etc., etc. But this still does not prepare her for the day that door suddenly opens, and she walks out into the world and sees a bright red rose. So Mary knows something now that she did not know while still in her room. This is new datum. She has become acquainted with a property she was ignorant of before. So she knew everything about the brain. She knew what it even looked like, perhaps, when someone saw a color, but she had never seen a color for herself. And this erupts into an entirely different experience. Therefore, complete knowledge of the brain does not add up to knowledge of the mind, and the thesis of materialism is false, right? So complete knowledge of the physical material brain does not add up to knowledge of the mind. Not even an iota, in a sense, right? Um, you could go all your life without knowing a, a, a shred about the brain, the material structures of the brain, but have had lived an entire life of the mind and have great knowledge, right? So there's no correspondence. Appearance itself is a mental thing, and she, Mary, did not get to gra did not grasp that appearance while still in the room. There is something that was missing, and that something is nothing other than consciousness itself. Okay. Likewise, McGinn also uses the example of a bat. Dualism. Okay. So this is the. Um, so if we've sufficiently. Um, covered materialism there, the idea that conscious experience is reducible to the material inner workings of the brain, then now we can go on to dualism. Um, philosophy abhors a dualism, says a philosopher named David Bentley Hart. Whereas materialism, materialism takes up the scientific view of the mind, where consciousness is reducible to neurological processes and therefore identical to them, dualism inhabits the common view of the mind. Sorry, sorry I should say the common sense view of the mind, the one we sort of all sort of loosely hold. Um, and one we might say that um, our society, the zeitgeist of our times, sort of loosely holds and quietly accepts. Um, in that we, none of us has really taken a deep dive into the subject. Um, dualis, dualism comes in different forms, but for our purposes, it is best interpreted as the belief that there is no logical relation between brain and mind. There is no possibility of reducing the mind to the brain because they are separate realms. So, uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so, 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 so the opposite from the obverse of materialism, where we can reduce uh, the mind's consciousness to the brain, dualism says there is no such reduction because they are separate realms entirely. There are indeed empirical and contingent relations between the two. Correlations between mental and physical processes have been discovered, but they are distinct existences. The reason we cannot explain the mind by reference to the brain is simply that it is not essentially dependent upon the brain. Consciousness is an extra feature of the universe, as basic as space and time and matter themselves. So this isn't McGinn's assertion. This he's, he's taking up the position of what a dualist would say. 
So there are indeed empirical and contingent relationships between them, but they are ultimately distinct existences, right? What does he say in the book? He says, like, parallel skis. Um, they, they Or like skis, they run parallel to each other, but they don't necessarily ever need to really touch. Um, it is not that dualism is mistaken in its response to the data. Consciousness certainly seems quite different from a mere brain process. My hearing of a loud bang, say, presents itself as a different kind of thing from the electrical activity in a certain part of my brain. So, so it's a justified or justifiable um, consideration. <clears throat> but it's only a hypothesis, and we have to see it through, right, and see if, this, uh, if it actually obtains, if it holds water. The problem is that dualism goes too far in accommodating the data. It responds to the appearances by declaring the mind quite independent of the brain. It renders the brain irrelevant to the mind in a way that it cannot be, okay? In, in a way, it renders them irrelevant to each other, perhaps. So so there's two problems here um, that he takes up, the zombie problem and the ghost problem. And the zombie problem, first off, is, um, is the notion... Um, is that dualism allows us to subtract the mind from the brain while leaving the brain completely intact. They in no necessary way cohere together. They are not integral to one another. They're not fitted together in any necessary way. Mind is merely an epiphenomenal response, or can become one in this understanding. Now, an epiphenomenal response is a, a sort of a secondary re response to a primary um, phenomenon. So. Um, it's the view that mental events are caused by physical events in the brain. Okay, so 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 that our mind is merely hovering around, hovering around what is other what we could otherwise otherwise consider a zombie. You know, us. So we're just out here. We're sort of determined by our environment, doing all these sorts of things, and our mind is just sort of a, um, again, uh, a sort of side effect, as I say here. In other words, what we experience in consciousness is merely a secondary response to a primary phenomena. The material body does what it does, and my mind is a sort of lazy, idle spectator hovering around it, thinking it's running the show, having these experiences, while in reality it is just a side effect of the show. Sorry, you guys, you can probably hear my kids screaming in the background. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't have an office in this shoebox of house. Um, Dualism makes my mind into an idle spectator of what happens to my body. The only way to restore efficacy to the mind is to strengthen its ties to the brain, so that it is not possible to peel the mind off the brain and leave the brain as it is. The mind must be more bound up with the brain than dualism allows. In particular, the way the mind causes behavior must somehow recruit the brain, or else it cannot cause behavior. Sorry guys, I had to. I, I promised I wouldn't uh, stop these lectures, and I would try to do them fluidly all the way through. But as you heard there, I had a little bit of I had a, some business to take care of where there with the with, with my daughter. Um, so <clears throat> the next problem here is a go. This the go the problem of the ghost ghost problem, and this is the converse to the zombie problem. This is going the other way. If the mind is separate from the body then not only can the brain exist without the mind, but the mind can exist without the brain. So how could, and here are some of the difficulties, how could a mind be located anywhere without a body to anchor it? How can it have effects in the physical world? How could we manage to pick out and describe one disembodied mind rather than another? We think we can imagine detaching ourselves from our bodies and floating away in space to a happier place, but this idea is fraught with conceptual difficulties, namely the ones uh, we've just implied there in those questions, you know, are you and your body truly too? Are you and your mind too, right? Can a mind be located in the world without a body to anchor it? Um, okay, so McGinn restates the problem uh, in this first chapter. Uh, the problem with material materialism is it tries to construct the mind out of properties that refuse to add up to mentality. 
It assumes that if you put enough pieces of neural chalk together, you will eventually get some conscious cheese. He, he, he's great with metaphors. The trouble with dualism is that it cuts the mind off too radically from the brain. It assumes that the mind can go about its business without the machinery of the brain to assist it. So what is McGinn's solution to this problem? Consciousness is rooted in the brain via some natural property of brain tissue, but it is not explicable in terms of electrochemical processes of the familiar kind. We need a qualitative leap in our understanding of mind and brain, but I also hold that this is not a leap our intellectual legs can take. So this is more or less the, the Mysterian solution that um, fellows like uh, Colin McGinn and other uh, philosophers hold. Um, now, I, I'm wary of this, um, I'm wary of his particular solution um, in one particular way. Um, because if, 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 if he is suggesting that this property is a material property in the brain, and that this material property is beyond our lights. It's like, um, again, beyond our intellectual horizon. If it has some sort of, if it's merely material, but so complicatedly material, um, then again, he is just stating that um, the immaterial emerges from the material. And while we can't see this, perhaps speculatively, because he's being very speculative here, um, perhaps some other being, or maybe some computer could see uh, one day this, um, this connection. But again, we get the problem of the Big Bang to the soft shutter. How does the Im immaterial emerge from some sort of material property? Um, it's to say that the immaterial is reducible to the material. Um, so this is problematic, but if he is saying, because it's problematic because it defers our problem, we still have the same problem. How does the immaterial consciousness emerge from the material? But if, if he is, on the other hand, saying that it is, um, and I should say, and if he is saying that it's a material property, then he's kind of going against that Socratic learned ignorance that we were talking about before, um, where we're not reducing things to some simple um, positivist answer. Because again, if this is a material property, if there's just some, some subatomic or atomic material matter in our brains that actually holds and can explain the emergence of consciousness, then, then we're just saying that there is a positivist solution to this. There is a reducible answer. It's just that our intelligence as human beings can't actually um, make it out, right? So again, it just defers the problem. We're saying that there's a positivist solution to this, um, that there isn't an actual mystery at all. It's just saying that some greater being, some greater intelligence than our own would be able to solve this, um, this problem on the positivist terms that we're looking to satisfy. Um, on the other hand, if he is saying that, um, and of course I would know if I had read the book, but I've only, I've only read this chapter and a few others, and he hasn't made it clear yet to me. On the other hand, if he is saying, though, that there is an immaterial quality that's beyond our intelligence, then he's still within the lines of that learned ignor ignorance of, uh, that Socrates spoke about. And indeed, if we're saying that the material actually emerges out of the immaterial, then we're going back to um, the classic way of thinking. Um, and the classical way of thinking more or less goes as follows, that there is a natural and necessary union between the soul or the mind and the body. Um, that the body, and I've mentioned this in a previous lecture, that the body um, fills out the immaterial soul. So that, indeed, our soul isn't some sort of spare tire banging around inside our bodies, in our chests or in our heads, in this great cavernous space. Um, but rather, our soul fills us out right to our fingertips, right? So that we are incarnated souls. So that this thing that I will with, this thing that I think with, this subjectivity that I experience, this is... Um, this is the whole of me, 
right? And my body, the corporeal aspect of this, is how it's expressed in time and space. And now we see um, how natural this union is, the classics, classicists like Aristotle, or, well, they didn't call themselves classicists because they didn't, <laughs> they weren't classical in their own time. Um, but they would, you know, the, the, the very death of the person shows us the absolute necessary unity of these, um, of mind and matter, right? Of body and soul. Because death is a separation of these two things, they would, they, they, they would argue. So that there's a real violence done to this union. So they're absolutely necessary. And death is the very um, uh, event of this violent separation of what is naturally united. Um, so that, that's basically the, the classical view of uh, mind and matter, though they would say body and soul. Um, and, I, 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 you know, I've been using Aristotle and Plato, and, and Aquinas is in this picture too, in the center, who he, he was a Christian, and, and for Aquinas, as for Augustine, and as for all those in the Christian tradition, the first 500 years of Christianity was pretty much mapping out what this meant, what body and soul meant in Christ. And it was the first real, um, I guess, first real exploration of the person and this union of body and soul being the composition of person and personhood. Um, and there was war, wars fought. There was many councils over the abs the, how, how um, the spirit was indeed incarnated in the person of Jesus Christ. So, so I'm not trying to sell anyone on, uh, <laughs> on, on Christian understandings, but I, I, I am trying to say, trying to sort of illustrate how, how, how the vintage of this, this problem, um, that will always be a problem and that very, um, can't be reduced. Like everything we've talked about, pretty much our answer is it's irreducible to any sort of positive, positivist, discursive, hyper-rational expressions uh, or answers. Um, so I, I will leave it there. Um, we can talk more about the classical view. I'm not, I'm not holding anyone to um, put that into their essay. What I really want you to be able to, if, if you choose this as your essay, and when you study on this for your exam, um, to have a basic understanding of this classical view that the soul is incarnated in the flesh, um, as I've said, um, it might, might, might be, a it might be important. Um, but you, you don't need to go into this onto your, in your essay. What I'd, what I'd hold you to if you were to write an essay on this uh, and an explanatory essay, um, would be, um, everything we've talked up to talk to about uh, up to this point. Um, and, 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 um, in terms of materialism, dualism, et cetera, et cetera, and how this is an ultimately a problem that can't be solved um, in any sort of positivist, reducible way. Um, in any case, you can argue that. But uh, l l let me leave it there, um, and we'll talk more about it on Wednesday night. Um, so I'll, I'll, I wish you guys all well. I hope you're all holding up. Um, I know it's, it's been a rough um, week or two now. I was able to joke last week, calling this the COVID lectures, but but I think now it's probably hitting more of us, um, hitting more of us at home, right? Uh, whether you have friends who are hospital employees or grocery staff or whoever they might be, or people or indeed friends or family that might be sick, um, take care out there, um, stay strong, and um, yeah. Good luck to all of you. I'll, I'll speak to you on Wednesday night. All right.